Well, welcome everybody to our talk today for the Ed Anderson Taylor Communication Institute. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Crystal Lumpkins, who is an associate professor in our very own Department of Communication here at the University of Utah. Just joining us this semester, right? Your first semester here. And so we are super honored and thrilled that we have her on our faculty. But not just on our faculty, she's also part of the cancer, she's a cancer communication researcher within the population sciences division at the Huntsman Cancer Institute, just up the hill here from us. She was formerly an associate professor at the University of Kansas School of Medicine, Family Medicine and Community Health Research Division, uh, and courtesy associate professor at the School of Journalism and Mass Communication there as well. <coughs> Her current and primary research interests are in evidence-based public health communication, cancer-related genetic counseling and testing, risk communication, and implementation science targeted to racial and ethnic minority populations. Her research is community-driven, where she takes a community-based participatory research approach. In this work, she engages with African-American, black immigrant, and other underrepresented populations in Kansas, Missouri, and of course now in Utah as well, uh, in an effort to address cancer health disparities and health communication inequities within uh, those communities. She's currently principal investigator of two Huntsman Cancer Institute pilot projects, Five for Five Fellowship Program, and the HCI Population Sciences Community Outreach and Engagement <coughs> Partner Award. She is also co-investigator of the Black Breast Cancer Survivor Engagement to Solve Diagnostic and Treatment Disparities Project at Kansas University Medical and chair of the FaithWorks uh, Connecting for a Healthy Community uh, Consortium that is comprised of faith-based and community-based organizations, cancer survivors, nurses, physicians, and research professionals. Dr. Lumpkins received her doctorate with an emphasis in health communication and strategic communication in 2007 and a Bachelor of Journalism degree in 1992 from the School of Journalism at the University of Missouri, Columbia. She received a dual Master of Arts degree in Media Communication and Management from Western University in St. Louis, Missouri in 1997. So it is a great honor to have her here to speak with us today, to have her on our faculty and at the University of Utah. So please everyone welcome Dr. Crystal Luckin. That was so gracious. When you were reading that, I said, oh my goodness, who is that? But, <laughs> but, um, but I will tell you that um, those things that you spoke of me, I could not have done that without support. I know my husband's on his way, um, and community members like Ms. Adelot um, that's here, um, and I just appreciate the support of this amazing rock star um, faculty. So um, I want to also say, so thank you so much for um, this opportunity to um, give this presentation today for this endowed um, communication. I'm just um, blown away by um, when I was reading about Edna Anderson Taylor and her legacy as a broadcaster at KSL and um, just the inroads that she had as a broadcaster. I think about my own background as a broadcaster and um, John, I hope that I'm putting them on the spot and, and Mike, we were talking about the broadcast days and um, you know, there's a lot of things um, that, that I learned from the splicing the tapes and taping all of that. But, um, but what I will share with you um, today is, you know, just that um, the intersectionality of who I am and the background and how that all led up um, today, today as, as a researcher. Okay, so. These are some of the things that I'll be uh, just, you know, highlighting today in the talk about the role, um, who I am, uh, where I've been, and how that's been so critical and important to addressing um, health disparities, and specifically cancer um, disparities. And then um, public health communications, community engagement. And then I will also talk about um, past and present uh, research projects and then opportunities and next steps. And something I really wanted to say too before I go forward is we've heard about health disparities, we talk about it, but um, you know, I was, as I was preparing for this talk, um, I had to reflect and say, okay, it has been, we've been talking about this for a long time, so why hasn't 
it changed. There's been some movement, but why hasn't it changed? And so I will say, this is being recorded, I will say that <laughs> communication has been almost, to me, the stepchild um, of uh, just advancing um, science, in my opinion. And even Bernhardt, this is from an article several years ago, 2004, says communication should be the core of public health communication and it is not. So I think it's really important as we advance our science to think about just, you know, uh, science communication, the science of communication, and, and also uh, pushing and advocating for uh, communication to be the, the, at the very core of that type of science. So I just want to make sure I say that. So I am a teacher and I am, a, so you probably guessed I have put a, a interactive component in here. So if it is possible, I hope that you have your phones. If you could go to uh, this web page and there are three questions that I would like for you to uh, answer. And so I'm gonna launch this if I'm doing it correctly. Okay, can you see that? Okay, so there are three questions and um, if you pull that up, you'll have to put in that number 276808 and it's uh, addressing disparity. So I'll give everyone a few moments to get to it so that I uh, can launch that. And maybe if just a thumbs up by people if you, you know, when you get there, hopefully it's working. Okay, good. Okay, all right. So I will go to this first question and I will launch it. Uh, it says health disparities are best described as, and there are, oh goodness, I think you see the answer, but <laughs> so how can I? <laughs> so anyway, I don't, I, maybe I can, you know, minimize it, but <laughs> so, so probably have the right answer, but um, just go ahead and <laughs> answer that question. And I'll just give you a, a few moments to answer that. Are you able to submit your response? Okay, good. How many people need more time? Okay, so let me just see if I can pull that back up. Okay, so we have most, uh, the 77% for, so that is the correct answer. And when um, I get back into the presentation, um, I'll just go ahead and you know define that. But uh, one thing I will point out now that that compared to the other answers, um, the operative words in that this uh, description, preventable differences, lost opportunities, socially disadvantaged populations. Okay, all right. Um, are you able to pull up the second question without me showing it? Uh, the, it's, well, it's right there. It, health equity or equality and health equity are synonymous. Is that true or false? And I'm going to uh, launch that. Okay, so let me see what the results were. Okay, 100%, they are not synonymous. And we will talk about that actually, you know, some lay persons, uh, people in communities, um, you know, just lump that together. They are important uh, factors um, in health disparities, but they are not synonymous. Okay, last final question. What is the leading cause of um, death among U.S. residents under the age of 65 in the United States. And so there are, um, what is it? I think it's heart disease, suicide, um, cancer, and there was uh, one other in there as well.
Okay. Now, the operative word here um, is under the age of 65. And so uh, heart disease is a leading cause of death, but actually under 65, cancer. And this is according to uh, the National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute. And so this was surprising to me, especially, um, you know, I've worked with African-American populations and, and um, for instance, breast cancer um, actually occurring in African-American women before 40. And you know, 40 is the recommended age based on evidence based, you know, science um, and population data that that is the age to screen, but there are disparities. So we will get into that right now. So thank you so much for uh, doing that. I appreciate it. Okay. So here, um, the definition I pulled uh, that was actually on the, uh, that poll but uh, highlighted some things in these definitions about disparities. Preventable differences, this is from the CDC, um, in the burden of disease. Uh, and then there's another uh, definition I hear, have here from Kaiser Family Foundation when we're talking about health disparities among patient populations. And there are patterns. Um, and one of the reasons why I think that it is so important to have um, a definitive or defined uh, definition, if you will, is that you're able to take that definition, have a clear definition, and identify what it is you need to do, right? Um, and so, um, again, with the populations that I'm working with, um, having not only you know, uh, this as a guide, but then talking to them uh, as far as what they're experiencing, what is their lived experience, is what they feel um, health disparities are as well. Health equity, health equality, um, or health equality, health equity. You cannot talk about health disparities without talking about these two things. And so they, as um, they, I think it was 100% that people, uh, when we went through the poll, that these are not synonymous. And so uh, one of the things that I wanted to also uh, point out here in the definitions um, health equality, okay, that's a, that everyone has a fair, you know, chance to have access to health care. Um, they have a fair opportunity to, to receive some type of, or, or in this case, screening. Health equity, though, means if I have an opportunity to get screening, how is it that if I don't have transportation to get, go to the doctors to get the screening or I, um, my insurance, I'm underinsured, meaning you have insurance, but it's so high that you just say opt to not get it. I mean, there's been cases of people that have actually, they've had insurance, but they say, okay, this is just too much, too high. Um, forgive me, good nurse, anyone, Netflix people in here. <laughs> so, uh, but anyhow, I digress, but, um, but you, you get it. If there's not, um, um, equity, and I like this last sentence here, uh, meaning health uh, is inequity. There's not equity. I like this um, graphic here. And this graphic, um, I actually used a, a different one a few years ago when I was teaching a social determinants of health class uh, and specifically talking about health communication inequities. So this, if you'll see the inequality and equality, and equity, justice. So in this first uh, quadrant here, you'll see that the tree is bent and it's leaning toward the individual like, all oh, right, here, this is the apple. I don't have to work for it. It's just coming, gravity, you know? Uh, but then you see the other person like, what? You know, I, I, I'm not, I don't have access to that. And equality, as you know, in the uh, definition, they both have ladders, right? Um, they have the tools that they need to get to the tree, but the tree is still bent toward this person, and they are easily picking the apples and they're putting them in the sack. And over there, it's just like, wait just a minute, I'm really getting upset here. I'm, I'm up here and I can see it, but I can't access it, which is frustrating. Then equity, okay, well, um, here the person has a taller ladder, and they're both, but still, do you see the tree is still bent toward that way? And so that's, it's more ease. That person doesn't have to, 
work as hard trying to get to justice, which justice means you see that, I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's the, uh, where the anchor and the tree is now straight. And so um, they both have um, equal footing, the, the ladder, and then the tree has been straightened by those two tools, which means policy levels, uh, fixing the system. And so um, just wanted to keep the, your, this in mind as a, a framing as we talk about health disparities. And so with cancer um, statistics and um, cancer disparities, this is, and I know that's a little bit small, but these are just the estimated case, new cases of cancer um, uh, for the United States, not globally, but United States, and then estimated uh, deaths, and that's from this year, the report. Uh, and again, as you probably know, that with population data, it takes a while uh, to, for, so this actually is coming out in 2022, but this is probably, this is from at least two years ago, okay? And so this other, I wanted to show you this um, AACR report. And as you look at that across this, the red there, African-Americans at the top, alarming, 100 and I think 11% to 39%, and this is specifically breast and prostate cancer. And, and then there's the um, Hispanic, I think children, leukemia, and other racial ethnic groups. And it's not just racial ethnic groups here too. I think they, all, they also point out Kentucky, which has some of the highest cancer rates in the country. And so why is that? What my colleagues and myself have talked about, I don't have it up here, but there's a um, social determinants, and I'll explain what that is, that many times um, in the past, there's been a perspective to look at the patient, look at people from a bio uh, medical model, essentially. But now that we understand, we know that it is more than just that, it's this bio, uh, psychosocial, environmental, all those different factors that are contributing to these things. And so, um, for instance, in this model that I'm, I'm speaking of, it is amazing that more than 60% of the causes for cancer, they're not clinical. There are social, environmental, from those things that I just spoke about, the, de the determinants of health, the being in a food desert, having, I mean, you'll be surprised, just living in neighborhoods that have a lot of light in them at night because people can't sleep, um, having check cashing. I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, but when different places in the city, there are people, this is unfortunate, I'm getting kind of emotional, talking to community members that their grocery store, that is a convenience store that's where they get their food. That's the closest <laughs> way they can get uh, their hands on food. And so there has been a lot of work in that area just to get grocery stores in those areas. So this is just a little bit more of, uh, just more detail about the cancer landscape. Um, and Utah, I, my good friend Andy back there uh, at HCI, um, Yelena Wu, um, was, we were talking about Utah has the highest melanoma uh, rate in the country. I didn't know that. It's like, oh my goodness. And so, um, but Utah also mirrors the, um, as far as the cancer being the second leading cause of uh, death. And unfortunately, same um, just notes about African Americans and uh, cancer screenings. This is something that, again, as you remember, I was talking about that population data and taking some time to to actually um, see the, the numbers that are impacting the communities and populations. I posted something on LinkedIn a few weeks ago, or actually last week, and it was a, it was a very positive report that um, cancer, the trend is going down, but someone, a scholar said, well, that's, you know, I, that's, a, that's positive, but what about, I think it's, there's an uptick because of what, the pandemic. And so during that time, the pandemic, a lot of, I was talking to um, American Cancer Society, uh, Cancer Screen Week is next month. And so we're preparing, gearing up for that. And she said, Crystal, do you realize the screening is down 50%? I was like, 
uh, I don't know, are you 50%? And so um, right there on the blog, the NCI, uh, this news and events, I went out and I said, oh my gosh, this is, yeah, it's, it's down. Um, and so I'm bringing this up because there, now this is even exacerbating the, the situation even more. And so um, again, contextually, people I'm talking to just informally are saying, you know, Crystal, um, yes, I know I'm supposed to get, you know, this type of screening, that type of screening, but I'm still a little bit nervous, a little bit scared to do that because of, I mean, those are psychosocial factors, but then also because of other things, social determinants, access that have um, been, um, for lack of a better word, have been uh, exacerbating those, dis those disparities. So I wanted to show this because, again, um, communication, just like we, you know, the cancer disparities, communications, there are different gaps on multiple levels. And I, um, I know my husband's back there, I'm gonna use this word agnostic. He's like, what? No, <laughs> just, but, I, uh, but I am agnostic when it comes to the, as far as looking at multiple levels, because um, when I started off my public health communications just journey, I was very much focused on this level, this interpersonal um, and somewhat interpersonal level by looking at different theories, you know, like theory, plan, behavior, health, belief model, and how um, certain things impact individuals, such as with me working with uh, church populations, um, it was the spirituality. How does that impact them, impede, or facilitate them wanting to do something? But as I you know, went along in my journey and started talking to pastors and you know, just saw some phenomenons going on here, like, wait just a minute. Okay, when the leaders of these organizations, not just faith-based organizations, community-based organizations, affinity organizations, people, and some of you may not remember this, E.F. Hutton, you know, you listen, may not remember that, but I do, that's dating me. But, um, but when these people are talking, they listen. Not all the time, because you know, there's been issues in you know, faith communities and so forth, but uh, they had such an impact. And so it was almost like this trickle down you know, effect. And so churches being a part of these other collection of churches. And then, you know, um, a few weeks ago, uh, the Ministerial Sterile Alliance having such an impact on civic engagement. So it's not just about health, but it's about wholeness. And that's a part of the, the topic today about achieving wellness too. And so it's the whole person. So getting back to then the communication gaps, mass society, you, I know this department, this faculty is very, um, knows about this with the spread misinformation. We had an infodemic uh, with COVID-19, um, but I would say in the cancer world, there has been you know, a lot of, again, fear because of that to go get screened and then um, Grapevine. I mean, that's, um, I have citizen journalism up here. I, um, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'll just talk about uh, some solutions in a minute. So let me just put a pin in that. But uh, so Grapevine as far as community um, or community network information, organizational, uh, where again, this is drawing from my experience with the church, can be actually a, an impediment if it's just insular and it's like top down and it's not inclusive of, of how can I say, those people within that organization. And then peer um, uh, groups can be negative, right? That could be negative if they're like, okay, you know what, this happened to me, do not go. And I've actually had a group of women, I'm not making this up, in Missouri that said, you know what, you should not go and get this mammogram because it hurts too much. I'm not, I, you know, just don't do that. Or another person said, I just don't want to think about it. Maybe I can pray it away. But we know that that's something that that's very dangerous because, you know, it's, it could be preventable. Um, and then finally, um, intrapersonal where health illiteracy uh, negative beliefs, perceptions can impact the, that communication 
just within that person uh, making a decision. All right, so finally, um, I shouldn't say finally, but uh, this is the work that I'm doing now uh, in this space of genetics, um, counseling and testing risk communication. And so when in the context of that communication gaps, oh my goodness, there has been a plethora of things about genetics and genomics, which genetics is really, when you think about heredity, and um, genomics, the whole genome of a person. And so, but there is, um, in this, I guess this city, there is a company here that you can get your, your ancestry done. Um, and, but there's just like a lot of different um, information that's out there. And so, um, and it's good, uh, this is something where people that have access, people that have, um, money, uh, the perceptions about money, they can have access to do these t types of things. But one thing I wanted to point out, I'm not going to pull it up, is from this stat news, where this is a highly educated person, a journalist by the way, this is a couple of years ago, she decided to do this and she uh, did the test, but what she found was, she said, I was so disappointed, I was fearful because of the results. And at that point, there wasn't a readily available counseling. And so it was like, okay, I have all this information, but what do I do with it? And then what made matters worse is the, the, the results were inconclusive, what we call VUS, or variants of unsignificance. And that was even more confusing because it's like, okay, do I go down this path to have treatment? Do I not? And so those re results were sort of inconclusive. And so that was just, you know, for her, that was very frustrating. And so when I've talked to also people um, as I've gone on this journey with talking to people about this opportunity, they're like very excited. Okay, this is great. But then one, it seems like it's too expensive. Uh, and two, it's, it's just, it's confusing. This is um, a, just a snapshot I took of the, from the National Society of Genetic Counselors. And this is uh, just another a barrier, unfortunately, to having all this information out there about genetic counseling, genetic testing. And there's actually a push now, there's legislation uh, right now for access um, or for, to give genetic counselors more, how can I say it, um, I don't wanna say power, but just for some of these services that they want to, to give, for it to be more equitable. Because right now, that's not the case. And so um, I just wanted to make sure I pulled, uh, pointed this out. And this being um, also at the policy level that I spoke of earlier, um, so if we are able to um, address, you know, this communication, especially these gaps at multiple levels, um, I, I think, and this is again my opinion, again, communication being at the core of all of this, this is one solution. I'm not saying it's the only one, but it's one solution of when this is fixed, having that communication, okay, this is available, the education, and so forth. Okay. So this is a little bit, I, I kind of preempted myself before when I was talking about my um, experiences, but um, as you can see, I'm African-American, uh, but uh, uh, I, um, you know, but I will say that when you hear the clip that's coming up, I went into a meeting in 2009 as an African-American in an African-American meeting and I was shocked shocked at what the response I received. I was like, oh my goodness. You know, just because the exterior, it, it's, it's more than that. It's your, the trust. It's also, um, you know, I grew up uh, until what it was uh, kindergarten, I was in the urban core, but then I moved to the suburbs. So a lot of those experiences that some of my, you know, people that say, you know, it was hard for me you know, I had to scratch and everything to get to college, to do these different things. 
and um, I just did not have the same type of uh, perspective as you know some of these individuals that have been in the urban core for all of their lives. So, but nevertheless, that's important, and that's what I want to make sure I relay today that all of us sitting in this room today have something to contribute, something to give to, and it doesn't have to be, I'm not trying to proselytize you as health disparities researchers, but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm just saying that it is um, all of us, um, our science and what we do is just so important. So, um, and then again, the, the, my professional work and then the, the work that I do um, has really been translated in, well into as, as a communication scientist. And I, I say this, and I don't take this lightly, I have had the privilege to work in this space. And this space, um, I, I see myself as an ambassador for those people that um, have been marginalized. And I want to be a bridge for them, excuse me, for them. And so this is, um, lack of a better word, there are no genetic counselors in here, right? <laughs> but my DNA, it's in my DNA, uh, you know, the civic journalism in me. Um, because when I was in the field, I just found myself really pushing for certain um, health related. I, I said, you know what, Crystal, you are really an advocate for these individuals. And now today, is citizen journalism where you see people getting out their phones and you know, we're all can be a journalist. But what I specifically have done with my com the communities I work with, I have said, you are, you are an advocate. You can write an op-ed, opinion editorial. You can push this on the you know, agenda to, to have the, the city council to see what is going on. This is what you can do. And so I've used that experience. We held a, a, a workshop for pastors during COVID-19. And so, and then public relations. I mean, I got a lot of flack from my journalism colleagues. Oh, you're going to public relations? Yes, I am going to public relations. <laughs> because, oh, somebody said, I'll wait to get public relations. Because through public relations, I was able to learn how to really listen uh, in a, from a different perspective to the community. And I, when I was working in PR, um, I worked with neighborhood associations. And there are some things that the entity I was working for at that time had not. They just did some things that, you know, they did not ask community members. And so it was a lot of lessons that I learned how to engage and how to infuse that into our mission. And so that's been very important for me as a communication scientist. And then, of course, public health communication is just such a nice just overlap of so many things that I am of mass communication, health education, marketing, journalism, uh, public relations. And so I take all of that and uh, just utilize that for the science. And so as the communication profession, you know, journalism, public relations has been very important to solutions. So is my, the communication science that I do. And it is applied um, multi-level and the community engagement is such an important piece of that. Because when I, um, I'm looking at Queenie now, <laughs> but it, without people like her and at back um, my home, this is my home now, but former home, um, I am just like, oh my goodness, going back to the pastor story, it was eye opening. And I, I tell you, some of the comments on here, I was like, no, do you mean that? You don't mean that? I'm like, yes. So I'm going <laughs> to be transparent and let them, you know, them speak um, just momentarily here. So social determinants of health, I talked about that before. But what I want to point out is the communication as a social determinant. And so, um, you know, these will be available, the, the slides. But if you look at this kind of ecological uh, perspective where you have the individual back to the uh, slide I had up before about intrapersonal, interpersonal. Well, the communication and behavioral outcomes of an individual within an environment, if they have a environment, their infrastructure is very, like I mentioned, the peer support or the peer groups and um, all of that is, um, uh, there are gaps in communication then that's going to cause inequities. And so I pulled some things here where this modern healthcare, 
and it, the, the headline says, why patient communication should be considered a social determinant of health? Absolutely. And, um, and then over here, it's how poor communication exacerbates health, inequ uh, health inequities. And um, again, I keep preempting this, this um, uh, clip that's coming up, but you will hear the, one of the people, community members say that I try to, these are not her exact words, but I try to talk to the doctor, and this is doctor-patient, you know, interpersonal communication, but it's just dismissed. You know, and some people have said to me, you know, I have told this person what I am feeling, but they're just like, oh, no, you don't know. They didn't say these words, you don't know what you're talking about. But that's what it is. And it's, and I'm just gonna say it, it I hope I'm okay to say this, but sometimes it's a part of structural racism and it's a part of uh, bias and not really understanding who you are talking to and being culturally, having that cultural humility and, and looking at that person, not just as a, you know, just a number, but as a, a person wholeness. Um, so I think uh, many of you know that I am, the approach that I take is CVPR, our community-based participatory research. And so Israel, Barbara Israel is one of the well-known uh, individuals in the space, so is Wallerstein. And what is so important about this type of approach is that it is one that is looking at how, going back to policy, the, the big picture, looking at how to um, engage with the very people that are experiencing those disparities and addressing it from at multiple levels. And so here it's this Barbara Israel says, it's defined as focusing on social, structural, and physical environmental inequities through active involvement of community members, organizational representatives and researchers in all aspects of the research process. And so some of my colleagues that you know, do CBPR, we have to take a step back and say, do we really do CBPR all the time? I mean, we do it, but at any given point in time, you may not be doing CBPR all the time. And so what do I mean by this? So here we have, you know, community place where the researchers are in charge, and that's okay. Some of us have thought, oh, it's, you know, it's bad and we're doing it. No, it's okay because you have gone to school, you've gone through training, you've done that research, and you are leading those efforts at one point in time or, you know, different, so it's like it's on a continuum. And so here we have community-based research with the community, the researcher is still in charge, and that's some of the, you know, that I'm doing a lot of that research still. And then you have where community-based participatory research where that, um, in the introduction, thank you, uh, Dr. Lawson, that he talked about the new uh, grant from H HCI, which right now on paper, it will be where we're working, me and you, <laughs> we, we, we co we're co-PIs. So co-principal investigators. And so it will be equal. Um, and then um, what I love to, I, I just, it made me just smile, uh, community-driven research. Last, this is November, right? Yeah, November 10th. Um, September 20th, Dr. Michael Jones just blew me away. He's the pastor of Rama Church in Independence, Missouri, and uh, been working for, with him for about three years. And he gave a webinar on grant writing. I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. And it's, it wasn't just me, but I you know, had a part in that. But he is driving, that church is driving the research. So he's pulling me in, but it's led by them. And that is the, um, just the value and the richness of CBPR is that it's not just for, and, and again, one point in time, a lot of us do that type of research where it's a snapshot in time, um, but CBPR is, is just taking those snapshots in time and then just integrating it to like a long term for sustainability. So it's not just about the research, but it's about the, the vitality of the community and what the community sees is important. And this is, again, um, just a, a, a timeline of what I've done and uh, where I'm going. Uh, because that, this down here, this transdisciplinary scholarship and research, 
I am saying right now, I'm a, just an advocate for that. And when I say that, it's not just um, researchers, it's community members. Uh, I used to work in the Center for American Indian Community Health, and I learned so much from Dr. Christine Daly, so much from Dr. Christine Daly. She had people in the community that opted to go into research. I was like, oh my gosh, this is powerful. So these community members, some of them said, you know, that's not for me, but they were in, there's right now several different initiatives. I mean, she's, you know, in a different place now, but it's, it is just, has had such a ripple effect for American Indians. This is a timeline, I'm not gonna go through all of it, but I um, am so great, gracious uh, to have been able to lead a lot of these uh, initiatives for this consortium that started off as a CAB, actually, a community advisory board. And it is now a consortium, which is, um, you've read about the different people that are involved, different churches, and, and under that umbrella are community advisory boards for specific, their study community advisory boards. So out of that has developed a, a CAB, is Faith Works, that's just some of the things, um, a specific community advisory board that is um, investigates and looks at this cancer-related genetic counseling and testing. That's all they, I mean, that's, that's not all they do, but in this space. And so Dr. Lynn Miller um, is a doctor of divinity and uh, Ms. Evelyn Cooper is RNBSN and has been in uh, nursing for several years. And these two have been such an amazing partners with me in this process and, and looking at this. And so these are some of the things that bubbled up from their conversations. The trust, and I was like, wow, you know, this is, we've been working together for, not trusting me, but it's still there, you know, and there's a lot of things that have to be removed. Inclusion, representation, then what's next, next generation. And so I will play this clip. Dr. Miller, why do you think that engagement with researchers like me was important, especially in uh, the projects that we've done to improve uh, cancer communication in um, African-American faith communities? Um, the operative word is like you, and you look like me. And whenever I can speak with someone who's from my same ethnic ethnicity, it, it, it brings a level of comfort for me. And then I also know that that researcher is aware of what I am experiencing at my church with my, my membership, who are also people that look like both of us. And so it, it, is, it is important, it is really important when we're working in medicine that we find uh, doctors, researchers, um, nurses, uh, people who look like the, their clients uh, so that the clients are comfortable and they know that someone can really identify um, with them their culture. And culture is important. I don't, I don't care what anyone says. Culture is important. Everybody's different, but the more like them uh, like a person that you find, the easier it is for communication to be uh, expressed and understood. And I think that's one of the reasons why I, I, I did not even know when I met you that they were Black researchers. I mean, you know, like I knew, but I didn't know any. And when I met you, I was so excited. Not only were you African-American, you, but you was a woman too. And that made both of those two uh, characteristics made a big difference in, um, in why I felt it important. It was important for me and you to get together and try and come up with a solution uh, for cancer research in the uh, faith-based community. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, especially when you talked about culture and, and culture being mm -hmm. so important in research and, and especially in communication. And, and so I appreciate you because um, even though I've shared this story about 
there was um, a group of uh, pastors, not the group that we were meeting with that day many years ago, that really had, and, and rightly so, questions about my intentions. And it was surprising to me. I said, okay, well, um, you know, I'm African-American, but I think that because I was African-American, I did, you know, get my feet, if you will, into the door, but there still was a little bit of hesitation mm -hmm. and trust. And so, um, so culture, trust, um, individuals that look like you and me, very much so important in the communication process, health promotion. And so what you've done um, has been just so in, very important as mm -hmm. a, a leader that was in the Kansas City area for what, in uh, ministry for more than 40 years, correct? Yes. 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 And so those experiences. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I also wanted to rope in uh, Mrs. Evelyn Cooper in this conversation, uh, who I'm just, again, both of you um, have brought so much to Faith Works and the research that we've done. But I wanted to ask you, um, Ms. Cooper, as a nurse, you have um, several other initiatives that you've been involved with um, at your church, around the community. And so I'll, I'm just curious if you could just share with um, the audience today, why did you decide to work with KU Medical Center and with me um, as a, a researcher? I, like Lynn, I did not realize that there were real researchers that look like me and 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 mm -hmm. also and it was just such a inspiration to have an opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with someone that I felt would listen I think as Lynn mentioned and you've mentioned so often in our culture there is an absence of cultural awareness with our healthcare system our physicians our nurses yeah. And it's so important now and has always been to empower people of color to speak up for themselves. As a nurse, I realize that more than ever, how often a physicians will cut us off, not listen to us, think we don't know our body, think we don't know what we're talking about. And they believe that that's okay. I think with faith works, and working with clergy and ministers, our minister help us to, again, empower ourselves. We trust our ministers. If they say, and they begin talking about genetic counseling, for example, that's foreign to many people of color. We, we don't even realize what that is. We go into a physician's office and they'll ask us all these questions about what our mother died of, what our father died of, but never do they take the time in all the questionnaires to put information together and refer us to genetic counseling and testing, even the conversation. Once we hear it from our ministers, it becomes a word now that we recognize that it's no longer foreign, that we don't think someone is just trying to pull the wools of our, of, over us. We don't think that um, it's, it's only what our mother and father died of and, and it stops there. If they had diabetes, we have diabetes and then it stopped. If they had cancer, it, well, we may get cancer, but no one gives us an opportunity for genetic testing or genetic counseling or have a realism about that terminology even. The healthcare care system so often is leading us to distrust them because they won't listen. Right. I think I agree with you, Evelyn. Um, in, in, in our community, there's so much fear surrounding medicine that we, um, pe as people of color, are reluctant to, first of all, go to the doctor, you know, uh, because we don't feel that we can, we can trust what they're saying or we don't um, feel that they are, are, um, are willing to talk with us on our level, you know, or break it down to our level. They just keep talking and using big, 
big medical terms. And so that fear is real. That is real. And if we can help um, doctors of different ethnic backgrounds than African-Americans get some diversity training and understand mm -hmm. the, the variedness in their culture and be open to that, I think that would change the dynamic of how um, African-Americans are treated in the medical uh, profession and how they feel when going to the doctor uh, as well. I feel like it would help us speak up and, and would help us do cancer screening if we can believe what they're saying. And from the pulpit, when we hear cancer screenings are necessary or important, they're right. saving lives. I they agree. Increases in our mortality, even though we do have a high mortality, we're still getting more screening. The pulpit sends a message that we can trust. And then we can be empowered when we talk to our physicians, agree with them on some level, because we understand and they're listening to yes. us. So I think she was saying more of the same um, as far as just, again, those comments about um, being dismissed, you know, in the doctor patient. Um, interaction and in, in that appointment. Uh, but one thing I do want to say is that uh, when they t spoke about someone that looks like them, yes, th that is um, incredibly important, but what you didn't hear also are the, you know, and I'll play a short, another short clip uh, where there is multiple people from different racial ethnic backgrounds. In fact, there's a genetic counselor, both the genetic counselors are white but because of the work that they have done in the community, they are so loved and appreciated um, because of working for free, pro bono, you know, and, they're, and giving their time. So that was something that wasn't in the clip. Um, and I wanted to then just share with you just real quickly, because of, you know, the engagement, it's, you know, not just about the science, but what we, you know, have done since uh, me and, and you know, this group uh, since 2010 have um, had, you know, projects that have been funded or and also published and looking at, you know, cancer communication, uh, social marketing from the pulpit and so forth. But all of this was really important because, you know, as we were going through it, again, it wasn't just about the science, it was looking at um, multiple things. Um, this is getting into the research, like results, the, the projects. So I'll just share um, two projects, and one is, you know, two phases. Uh, so this one is the um, genetic counseling, like the mapping project that we had, the pilot study. And so we had no funding, but again, going back to Rod Phelp, he's Alistair Phelp, he was so like bothered by a phenomenon he was seeing among his patients um, that they were, um, you know, saw their names on the uh, list or the, you know, the, I'm trying to think of what it is, but the patients that he was supposed to see that day. And, but there were a lot of no-shows, kept not, not showing. It's like, I wonder what is, was going on. And, and then looked at the racial ethnicity, it was a lot of African-Americans primarily. And so, um, you know, he contacted uh, our department, our research division, and he said, I really would like to work, just ask someone that's working with African-American populations. And so that's how that all started. We started talking and we had exploratory conversations with our cat, you know, consortium and then evolved into a cab. And we, he again was so passionate about it. This man went out and, and raise money. He did talks to get the money, get it done. So it was like, wow. And so then we were able to, to do that with that philanthropic type of dollars and then uh, some C clinical translational science award we received. And so, um, so again, CBPR uh, based in, you know, theory led the, um, uh, as far as the, the focus groups, but um, we were at two different sites and um, very different sites. These one site was more uh, younger demographic. One was more the older demographics. And this was a first phase because we wanted to uh, 
collect exploratory data just on what, what people knew about genetics in general and then what they knew about uh, cancer-related genetics. And so it was really uh, uh, just interesting. I don't even know if you can see that, but it was, you know, there was some stark differences between those two uh, groups. And so forgive me, I don't have that, that side by side. Um, but the, in the older demographic or that older church, a uh, larger church, very resistant um, to anything about genetics because to, in their mind, it, you probably heard of Tuskegee, it, it just all these testings that was just like, why are you talking about this? And it's in the church and this doesn't even belong in here. You know, I don't even know what you're talking about or they didn't say, I didn't know what they're talking about, but just why are you talking about this here? And people like Lynn, her mother was a, a nurse. She, unfortunately, she is passed, uh, passed, but she was very active in this nursing ministry. And they were even asking her, why are you bringing the researchers in to talk about that? And so when we said, when they, we started saying, not genetics, but family history, that's when they're like, oh, okay, well, then maybe we can... We, that's something we can talk about. So that was a lot of different things that we were able to gain for the second phase. And so the, the first uh, or the younger demographic, um, that church very much so, you know, social media, uh, very tech savvy, um, younger uh, individuals and had a very different um, outlook on, you know, genetic cancer related, genetic counseling and testing. And so, you know, but some of the, the positive things um, was that, okay, this is something that could be life-changing information. And um, also this is something that we can, it's, it's a preventative tool, which, which it, um, it is. Co-authored paper with the community. And, and for our phase two, the um, risk assessment. So we wanted to take that exploratory data and to build this health promotion of a risk assessment software, which is Progeny. Progeny is a tool that genetic counselors use to um, take the assessment for cancer risk, okay? And so, um, and this uh, web-based tool um, is something that when those things are answered, uh, in the, that app, then, the, oh, then there's a, um, an output in which the genetic counselors could read. But in this process, 2019, the kickoff we had in the, the, the younger demographic church. And you know what happened in 2020. <laughs> so I was like, no. But, uh, but, you know, but we... <laughs> We're able to, for the, the younger demographic church, we were able to get, you know, the 28 people that participated. We had a church liaison that sent out a link. And, um, and then that link, the people um, you know, responded and then they answered. And, um, you know, out of that, uh, we, you know, had some attrition there because of the pandemic. And what I will say that, you know, we, there was a pilot. So when in the evaluation, we only had, you know, five people out of that because that at the time frame was from November um, uh, during for Thanksgiving. That was the rationale to kick this off with people get together with their families and so forth. From November 2019, then fast forward to this, these, this was taken in 2021. So it was, it, yeah, it was difficult. But one of the things about the progeny was that um, it was something that it was kind of, it was difficult for some because guess what? Progeny is not something that was created for an end user. It was for genetic counselors. And we were like, what, why did we go with that? But it was because it was uh, free and it was something that was easily accessible um, but hindsight is always 2020, right? And so, but through that process, it actually informed, I'm not going to talk about that here, but another uh, community project with the Latinx population. And we were able to take that usability. And then we had another um, uh, software, actually uh, GIA 
we're going not Gia, but a <laughs> bot <laughs> that um, is uh, was very kind of interactive with um, the uh, users. So, all right. So I know is the the hour is getting late here, but I. Uh, participant uh, comments on some of the evaluation for the uh, progeny. This participant one was saying it was challenging getting into the survey, just all these different things. Um, but uh, but this person also said, I think it also indicates the importance for people who adopt children. So looking at the utility of not just the actual app, but just the overall general going through that process for cancer related genetic counseling. And so, um, and then here are some other comments just about uh, the using that risk assessment. Okay, so finally, during that pandemic, um, I'm telling you, um, again, it goes back to CBPR and just finding innovative ways to com continue. We actually did COVID-19 study, that's a pastor study we did, but we also said, you know what, while we are in this space, what about, looking at complementary tools for communication. Okay, we talked about, you know, there's this um, risk assessment software and there's different things that can be done. What about in a campaign or this could be part of the communication approach? So this is, we did a, this is a pilot, a communication asset mapping study, which is actually a part of what I'm doing here at Huntsman. And so communication asset mapping borrows from community asset mapping. And what that is, is essentially you're looking at, it's a strength-based approach, and you're looking at uh, those things within a community that are beneficial or, or detrimental. And so, for instance, um, and again, I'm new in this community, but um, just thinking about what top of mind are libraries. I mean, libraries, you know, there's information there just because of what it is. Um, also, someone had mentioned in our process post office. I was like, post office sometimes. But, you know, that's where we were saying, okay, asking the community, where are spaces and places that you think would be where, if we had an ambassador in that place, would be a place where you could exchange information about this new thing. And so, um, um, and without getting into too many details, there's you know several different layers here as far as how that communication would be measured, how that communication would be observed, and so forth. But um, this aim was to develop this as information resource, and so then there was a dedicated cab, which I spoke, that met from October to September 20, 2021 and engaged with 24 um, people within the, the, the community of the specific churches that we looked at to do this communication asset map. And so here are the results from that uh, demographics. And we have specific zip codes around those you know, uh, two sites and then the uh, those are the counties that were represented, which, by the way, represented cancer disparities. So, um, and so here's uh, just some workshop logistics. Who was co-leading? Scribes are all you know cab members, but had different roles as far as um, you know. We had cancer survivors, medical personnel, so forth, and um, and then had some preliminary themes here about um, developing this map. And so, um, bear with me, almost done. I just wanted to share with this, because this is, I wanted to share this because it's just a snippet of our process and how I was uh, so just fortunate to have these different people represented different places in the community, but also different um, expertise, such as IT and uh, data, uh, management. So you're saying um, as we are actually in the workshop to capture it. Yes. I don't know how to do that. So yes, please. Yeah, that's that's what he said. I think that's what he's okay. saying because if you, yeah, you do that yeah. and you have it I don't know how on to a do phone that. or a tablet or something, <laughs> it's just about a, you 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 just filling it in and selecting it. Um, if that, that's if I'm getting him correct, right? Yeah, that's what I was saying. Uh, yeah, I can go ahead and take the information that you had on that uh, sheet on that uh, form, and I can go ahead and generate an application 
uh, you know, and make sure that it's really secure because of the nature of the information that's being uh, presented. Um, and we can move forward with that. And uh, with that, you know, we can uh, come up with a set of visualizations to accompany the data that we, you know, are collecting. Because, uh, you know, once, well, you've seen, I showed you, uh, you know, everything just goes to a spreadsheet, basically. Um, and we, you know, we can figure out a way or come up with a set of visualizations, graphs, or, or different kind of ways to visualize the data on our side to make it a more impactful presentation um, when we are putting together our package. Ooh. Let's get create. Yeah, we could create a little graph, yeah. the one that you had of all the places like the church, the store, the theater, the hospital, whatever, whatever, all those little places, and then um uh howard and and them could show little people walking to them and stopping <laughs> you know so 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 we could be seeing how many in the group you know was picking this and picking that and that would be so engaging and that's kind of like what uh angela provides for us through a a a a a computer program yeah again just appreciate all those different perspectives and just uh the contribution into that and so and one thing i didn't say is that we adopted this community asset mapping process for this communication asset map that was in for in person and that was all virtual and so that was a whole nother actually write, writing a uh, article for that so, so implications and next steps, um, a lot of lessons learned, actually what I just said, that um, had to be adaptive you know, in that process and um, in the middle of writing up results from that um, to um, inform not only you know, for grant funding, but then also for the project that will be here in Utah um, with um, Delta Sigma Theta and then also for this Five for the Fight project with African Americans and black immigrants, because one of the things that is um, very interesting to me is that um, there's unfortunately like a lumping of all of us into the same group, but there's actually, there's differences. And so I think that's something that through this process, um, we'll be looking at that data. Um, and then also here I have, you know, just, increasing the genetic counseling and testing access as we are doing this research, it is so imperative to allow people to have access to the testing. Um, and then of course the shared language um, and, and impacting our science. So um, this is a, just a photo of the Delta Sigma Theta. I am a member, I'll just be just open about that. <laughs> and uh, just recently received that funding and so really excited about that. Uh, just started, so we, I don't have any results from that, but uh, we'll have some community listening studios, which is a specific systematic way that um, to conduct uh, research with the community, it, um, borrowing from Consuelo Wilkins, who's very well known in the country. She's at, uh, was it Meharry, um, that model, uh, so systematic way of uh, collecting data with the uh, community and you know, specifically with these populations. So, um, so future directions, um, I, this is my, again, my mission is to uh, help. And then I'm hoping that communities will lead and I will be, you know, it's like, a, it's a, the shared governance, shared process. And then also what you didn't get to hear, I don't know if you heard that clip about Lynn, she was talking about next generation. It's so important that um, that there is um, just a concerted effort to get people into these fields because right now, like the genetic counseling field, I'm very fortunate to be um, a part of this R25, that's a, our mechanism through the National Institutes of Health to train genetic counselors. And I'm, you know, specifically the health comm, social determinants of health in this, uh, it's called GC First. So I'm really you know, honored to be a part of that. And one of the things they have said is that we need more people that are is more of diversity, not just racial ethnic lines, but several different lines. So, um, so the education opportunities for diverse students. And this just came, I just, actually I think the webinar was today. I was so excited to see this. This is 
the NIH has a common fund and that's where they prioritize, you know, different things and areas and there's money. There's actually COMPASS, Community Partnerships to Advance Science for Society. So that is, they are right now saying, we want community members to be in the forefront, driving the science. And so there was a, today, a, 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 I think a technical webinar. And so that's coming up and then you can't really see it's kind of grainy, grainy advancing health comm science and practice. I know Andy, you know about this, the common fund. And so this was so exciting for me to see. So I said, okay, this is great advancing our science. And so in conclusion, um, just multiple perspectives to address health disparities, um, being authentic in our representation, embedding those voices that are not traditionally there. And, and just looking at how we can work in a transdisciplinary capacity. So I have a picture of Queenie, <laughs> and I had to throw in a Delta Sigma Theta, so forgive me. But um, this just, to me, ties so much in is strength of mind that enables one to endure adversity with courage, fortitude. fortitude. Yes, so we have fortitude. So um, would be remiss if I didn't thank, um, thank you, Dr. Lawson, thank you, department, of communication for your support and for coming. And here's just a list of all of the team that I've worked with collaborators and the funding. So thank you so much. So you're in Utah. Utah is a very peculiar place, as you know. And the African American population is different from other places that you come. And I, I'm thinking maybe you need to have access to refugee community because what I'm learning from um, the refugee local communities these days, more than 35% of local um, refugee communities are coming from African continents. Um, substantial number, of course, given that what happened to you know Afghanistan and Ukraine, maybe that dynamic has n maybe or may not be changing, but. Um, Still, I think it's, it's, it's a good resource that you can look into. But what I'm a little bit concerned is that your research is informed by specifically African-American right, population. Yes. And what kind of a challenge you might um, can imagine if you bring those framework to these different types of African-American community, new citizens of America? That, thank you so much for saying that and that suggestion. And that is why I have partnered with Delta Sigma Theta. There are African Americans and black immigrants in our um, sorority. And there's also uh, just a, a very concerted effort by my part to say, I do not want to take what worked in Kansas and Missouri and just plop it here. So thank you for that point. And we are just at the beginning where we are starting to have that conversation and, and it is imperative. So I didn't know that number, the 35% that you said, that's why it's so imperative that in these early conversations that they are at the table. And so the, um, the grant, the second grant that I refer to, the Huntsman Cancer Institute, the, the COE Community Outreach is a long name, Community Outreach and Engagement, doesn't officially start until January. But I have already had informal conversations with um, actually Kola Okayome, who is the chair of the um, um, family medicine that is from, you know, I'm not just monolithically saying that, but and actually have um, identified some um, individuals, uh, Sudanese population, so I don't know, but I just need to, but I really appreciate that because it goes back to that clip where I was saying I walked in, and I mean, that's African-American, but I just had a, a lot of assumptions. Mm -hmm. But I really thank you for saying that. It's a great suggestion. A uh, really interesting talk and the, the valuable work that you're doing in these communities. I'm, I'm interested in the context of faith communities. Mm -hmm. And you, you mentioned the one example of the, the older uh, population of one church was Yes. was resistant to talking about genetics and, you know, situated that historically and so forth. And so the, the question I have is, in a moment like that, where you're, you're in a community that is resistant to the, the kind of discussion you want to have, the messaging you want to do, um, how do you navigate that while still 
trying to be respectful of the context and the relationship you want to form, but also presumably as a researcher, kind of hopeful that you're able to, to message in a certain way about crucial health issues. So you know, how do you manage those, those, what I imagine are, are difficult dynamics? Yeah, it's very difficult because uh, me as a researcher, I'm thinking, okay, I started off with this design and I have, you know, an end that I'm trying to, you know, I, I have, I've submitted this. But in reality, and that's one of the complexities about CBPR and this type of work, you can't just barge through and just say, I'm going to do it. So at that point, I had to talk to the nursing uh, because they wanted it. They're like, what? You know, we wanted to do this. But I'm like, well, we, we can't do it. We have to do something else. And then what we did was there's a, and I, I think I'm okay to say this, what were you taping? But anyway, but I guess we are. But there's a, <laughs> there's a, um, a community, um, how can I say this? affiliation to this faith-based organization, this church. And so what they did, they said, okay, since we can't do that, Crystal, is it possible that you can just do some cancer work, screening type of education in that affiliated space? And that's what we did. Um, and so it was, um, how can I say, I think, I mean, I know that taking that approach is much better than me just barreling along and saying, oh, well, I'm gonna get that in. But then also, I mean, this sounds, however it sounds, but the pandemic, we never did even get to that church, you know? But no, but that was a, that's a good point. And then when COVID-19 happened, I was able to engage that pastor. Uh, he was a part of that op-ed workshop I was talking about. So it was the op-ed workshop. It was the cancer education at that, um, senior, it was a senior activity center. And so that's what, and then you take as a, as a scholar, okay, I mean, it is what it is. I had tenure process. I said, okay, we will write and we will publish on this. But um, I do want to ask and continue and piggyback off of Kevin's question. I'm really interested in the differences between the churches. Can you talk a little more about um, sort of the positioning from the younger church, the social media, active church and how they um, spoke differently about their sense of genetic testing. Absolutely, and one of the differences that I just top of mind, I remember there is the older church um, is affiliated with a very traditional Baptist uh, where it's um, a part of a, uh, a national, uh, not that they're autonomous, yeah. but it's very much so very traditional. And um, where they still, you know, they wear their, uh, the suits every Sunday and, you know, it's just, you know, the generational differences. And so in the younger church, non-denominational, and the pastors started that church. Um, and then they had what was woven in throughout the language in the focus groups was bloodline. It's like bloodline. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, what does that mean? You know, but they really saw... Um, this genetics as far as I, this is my heritage. And if I want to be uh, you know, proactive, this is a part of what I need to do. And so that was a different type of perspective. But, but as far as the, um, and, and those comments as I'm verbalizing this were more of the older people, but the younger people, um, they were more driven, it, it seems as I'm remembering, uh, from, okay, this is just like technology. This is something new. This is something exciting. You know, I want to be on the cutting edge. I want because in that um, that sample or from that church, we had an 18 year old, 18 to well, that's the age. You know, that was the inclusion criteria, 18 and over, older. Um, and so it was really in one of the focus groups. As I'm, you know, thinking about this too was. Um, there was a lot of interest, it was 13 people, which you know is that's kind of really big, um, but, um, but just had a lot of, um, also I had to try to keep them, you know, oh, you know within the scope of the, the focus, the guide, moderator's guide, but we're talking about other very innovative ways of disseminating information or getting information. Kind of based on what she <clears throat> asked about the different African-American and, and other groups that are here, um, what we've noticed, me specifically, as we've gone to churches and churches to, to see that although there's a smaller 
African American presence, they've been used to doing more right. with smaller amounts of people. Mm -hmm. And so it's this 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 interesting twist that the smaller people are they engage at a different level and but at the same time uh, many of the things that are, that are still there in Kansas City translate very you you you'll start a song amazing grace <laughs> people can finish that song here in a very similar fashion because culturally they've come from where we came from you see what i'm saying and so when we it's so it's a lot of stuff just the language that we use in communicating she's the barriers that she's she's talked about um she's already done some of the heavy lifting to say I know if I if I if I just barge in a certain way, I can't do it. But if I bring in the young people and the pastors to give us this um, validation, the the pastors are key many times to all of this thing happening. So I was just asking you to just um, say how much the pastors not just from the, <clears throat> the African-American community because she did a lot of work. And then why do I know? I know this because I live with her. <laughs> with the Indian, the Indian and in Native American populations with, with all these other, it wasn't just African-Americans. She's borrowed from a whole lot of other people to say that if you're going to go to a reservation, the chief better <laughs> be on board with what it is that you're saying because if they're, they're not, the, they will not hear you. I don't care. The, the, he will shut it down. But on the, the on the opposite, if you can get the, the chief to understand or the pastor or the leadership to understand, then they can help translate and even often persuade. So just the, the times when you've been able to, to, to get through some of the barriers because you've gotten high-level validation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there is, um, you know, a lot to say for those leaders, you know, just like we look at social media and the social influencers, would it be the influencers? And, um, you know, those uh, leaders have been very important for us to have access into those populations. But what I will say is that I have, I have not worked with black immigrant populations as extensively as I have with African Americans. And th while there are some similarities, I think, I believe, you know, being in this area, there are, will be some differences that I will see. And, and it is going to be important that those leaders within those circles are going to be important to have inroads into that. And, and the other thing I want to say, I, want, I failed to say, one of my sorority sisters said that when we were putting this uh, grant together, I was looking at the statistics and I said, well, you know, we're only 2% of the population, but she said, but we're here. Mm -hmm. We are here and we need to be, you know, this needs to be recognized. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, that is, that's absolutely, that's right. And so, um, so I just, again, uh, so thank you for your comment. I appreciate that. Just reminded me of that and how things are translatable. But I, I also think that we also, me, I'm just saying myself, have to be careful of just assuming, making assumptions, um, and thinking I can just you know take something that you know was there and and here, and that's why it's so important to have that exploratory research because we I am looking at what are those lived experiences and how is that going to be translatable into this type of health communication. I just want to say. Um, you know, you're here for Legion, and I can see how much um, African American population and black immigrant population can be benefited from your research. But what I noticed by just uh, beginning to have interaction with refugee communities, so much diversity, and the, the issue of equity in that context, it's much more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, they are exposed to, yes, racism, deep racism in this community. However, also they are struggling with what I'm struggling here. You know, I'm not African-American um, person, but I'm an you know, international person. So they're struggling with the linguistic barrier and cultural barrier. They are raising children in a country they did not grow up. 
similar to my experience, right? So there's much more complex picture here. And then among those, there are different also dynamics, different ethnicity, right? And then they wanted to claim that they are different. We're not just one gigantic people of color, right? Mm -hmm. So like honoring their differences, uh, at the same time, translating what you have into that community, it's a beautiful work, but I'm, I'm assuming it's gonna be very challenging, but I'm rooting for you. No, <laughs> like, oh my goodness, Sui. But no, and so thank you for those comments because as you were talking, I, I thought about a conversation I had with um, a counterpart from Latinx population where she said that Crystal, you know, in the focus groups that she, and this is in Kansas, um, but that she was working with that it was the immigrant status of they for fearful they were here without they're not a citizen and they were fearful of okay i am you're asking me about this genetic counseling testing but i'm fearful i don't want to do it because i might be sent back you know um, and so there's so many complexities like you said in the linguistics and the language barriers and so what i see is um, there's a lot of work to do and, and I'm up for it. I am up for the challenge because that is, you know, just going back to the beginning where I, I just know that I'm supposed to be a champion for people that are marginalized. And, you know, I am here for a reason, like you said. And so I appreciate just, again, helping me to very um, specifically think about that as I go into this and know it is not just one dimensional, it's multifaceted. And so there's language and, and what you're saying too is reminding me, okay, when I'm going into this, there is a reason why I do need to have inroads into, I'm just thinking about our sore mother shut in, which is with um, reproductive health and all those different things. And then to be able to have a person that is translating and, but to have these voices or those different resources ready to go. And if I don't have it ready to go, I need to get it done. And it's not, and I'm saying I, but we, you know, together. And, and I don't want it to be also that, you know, I'm just pushing something, the agenda, but already, um, you know, back to Reverend Lumpkin's comment, um, that some of the people here, it just seems like, because there's the, the lower percentage, and again, that's African-Americans, are just so ready to do the work um, and they're interested in this. And so I'm, I, the people that I've engaged with are really open to it. Um, but again, these challenges are some of the things we need to talk about when we have our first meetings. So that's good, thank you. I'm up for the challenge. I might be better than Bruce by the next year. No, I'm just, but it's, it's okay. But, can I do something that is probably very unconventional? Um, I did, I thanked the Communication Institute, but I, I, I'm putting you on the spot, Queenie. Um, I just, I have something. I want to give her her flowers while she can, because the community, again, um, you know, just she, I think I've only been here, what, three months? And I started working with this sorority and the community only like back in June before I think, I think officially started. But, um, but I just wanted to give you your flowers. Um, and uh, you have done so much. She just does so much. One of those pictures was, um, this is the second year you've worked with Huntsman. Yeah. Um, and she works tirelessly. She's been in nursing for 40 years. And 38 of those years, is it 38, have been here in Utah. And so Utah is a very different, I mean, <laughs> when you first got here. But she has been such a champion, and I just wanted to make sure that um, I acknowledged you. And thank you for sacrificing your time to come out today, all of you.